This episode is brought to you by BeWaterSmart.info. Is your yard summer strong? A summer strong yard is tough enough to take the heat and still look its best. Here's two ways to help. First, replace your thirsty lawn with native and low water use plants and install drip irrigation and high efficiency rotor sprinklers. You'll use less water and have a healthier, happier yard. Second, here's how to help your trees grow strong enough to handle the summer heat. First, check the soil with a moisture meter or screwdriver to see if it's dry. If you need a water, set up a soaker hose or drip irrigation at the outer edges of the tree's branches. Water your trees at least once a month. Find more helpful tips and videos at BeWaterSmart.info. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Hi everyone, welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host Marlene and this episode is going to be on tomato myths and random info. It's all the sort of random tomato information besides how to grow them. So we're not really going to focus on how to grow them, but all the myths around it and the tips and... um, yeah, we're going to dwell into different things. So joining me for this is uh, Joe. Joe, get with the program. Face the mic. There you go. Are you starting already? Yeah, I've already started. You recorded. I've already started talking. I've already started. The... Is that what you mean? Is that what you mean when I've started? Of course you did. Um, okay, so tomatoes. We know that you actually don't like whoa, whoa, tomatoes. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Why don't you give a little bit of an update? On my tomatoes? No. <laughs> my cat bites? All of it. I'm on antibiotics again, uh, third time in a year. Um, I've been rescuing these Bengal cats from a bad breeding situation, and I refuse to wear gloves. Why? Because I can't grip them very well. Have I showed you? Yes, we have. I've shown you examples of a guy Mm -hmm. that uh, is a vet somewhere. Mm Mm-hmm. That deals with feral cats. I swear to God, we took a, talked about this last episode. People are like, these people are just boring. We talked about the cat gloves in the last episode, Joe. We you really, still need them because now you got bit and, and, and you and refused I, and to wear them. No, I said after this bite, I will because this bite hurt real bad. He got down to the bone, okay, finger swelled on, right away. That's on. It's being recorded. I, I, that's fine. It's being recorded. It shows more that you have like just really not much to talk about except for cat gloves. I have a lot of cat stories. You're just focusing on the gloves. Yeah, they heard that story last time. Uh, what else? Well, we had the surprise party for your dad. 80th surprise party for your dad. Yeah. Um, that was a little stressful because you had to keep him at bay. And you had to do a ruse of going to look at a truck somewhere because he's just one of these guys who's like, ah, I'm just going to come over whenever I'm ready. That's just dumb. If you're not home, it's fine. I'll come and start doing things. And then you had to be like, no, no. Yeah. But it went off really well. That was good. It was a great excuse to get a lot done in my garden and have you build barn doors in two days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, but uh, man, this weather has been great. We're almost making it through the month of June without a 100 degree day, but it looks like on the 29th, we will have a 100 degree day. So we're not going to quite make it, but temperatures have been in the 80s with, you know, overcast skies here and there. Tomatoes and vegetables are absolutely loving it. Last year, horrendous year for vegetables. This year, the tomatoes are just, I mean, they haven't ripened yet. All the vegetables are looking good, but I think, you know, tomatoes were sort of the marker for um, how bad of a year it was last year because it was so hot, no rains. It's all, it's all good. No. Yeah. Yeah, And pests, I thought, and I mentioned before, I thought pests were going to be a problem this year. Diseases, no pests. It's really quite amazing what happens when you get rain in the winter. It's not like we're getting rain now. It's over winter. It's amazing. And cooler temperatures. So I'm happy about that. You have two more animal rescue stories that are semi outside the box for us because they're not your normal species. Well, you, I came across a pit bull that had been dumped off in a cage um, on a way to give a talk. And luckily someone was already there and he had opened the cage to give it water and released it. And he's like, I got to go to work too. And I'm like, I have a great idea. I'm going to have my husband come and hang out with this giant unneutered pit bull. And you did. You hung out. 
and poor guy was just scared yeah. until yeah. animal control came. Yeah. Hopefully he gets adopted. And um, we've been doing a lot of animal control calling because we had a sheep show up. You were – it was one of the days I actually happened to take a half a day off to get stuff done around the house before the party. You work from home. I'm outside in the barn, barn slash garage, and I look over and I'm like, huh, is that a new cat? That looks like a dirty white cat. And then I traced its body back and I'm like, that is a sheep that has been in here with me for I don't know how long. And of course, I got closer to it and scared it. And so I came up. Knocked on your office door, came in, you're on a call, and you're like, what? And I just sort of gesture that I'm going to text you, and I always love this. As I was texting this, I'm like, I can't wait for his reaction on this one because it was, there's a injured sheep in the barn. And, of course, you're just like, of course there is. Uh, so you're the sheep whisperer, though, because you managed to get a rope on it at first because it was trying to run away. And then we got a collar on it because, of course, rope was just choking it. Um, got a collar on it and then animal control came after a bit and you guys loaded it up and uh, I saw that it was pretty much rescued. Someone adopted it. So yeah, I wanted to keep it, but I thought it only had one eye. It yeah, it had one bad eye. It had one bad eye. Yeah. So yeah. You might have told this story last time. The sheep? Yeah. Ah, oh, damn it. I know. Oh. Your, your memory might be worse than mine. We may have to edit that one out. Hmm. I wonder if it's going to be the same or if you've modified I it. I think I went into more detail about it. Maybe. Yeah. Is this how boring our life is that we just retell the same stories how about bad sheep? bad memories are. I don't know. That might be up in the air, how boring our lives <clears throat> are or how – I mean, I don't consider our lives boring. They're incredibly hectic and crazy. Um, but you said two animal rescues. Yeah. What was the other one? The sheep. Oh, so you forgot that you had – Okay. Yeah. Then you were telling it. Okay. Then like, I was telling it without even I thinking. I think you may have told this. I think we told it. Yeah. Ah, damn. It was a highlight of our month. <laughs> okay, we had a sheep come in. We rescued a sheep. That's a highlight. Um, okay, should we just go on before we start repeating the same stories? <gasps> One time <laughs> back in. <laughs> you could do the sheep story like every third episode. I should. Yeah. I should. It'll, it's new to me telling it. Yep. Yeah. Might be new to other people. We have yeah. new listeners. They might not have heard the sheep story. Yeah. If you've already listened, I think I told more details. I think I went into it a little bit more. Yeah. All right. Should we move on? Let's move on to about tomatoes. Yeah. We might find other things to talk about. Yeah. It's all we got because that's all we could remember. Mm -hmm. that, that was it. Okay. So tomatoes. Everyone loves tomatoes. It's sort of like the uh, the holy grail of growing vegetables. Um, which is strange because I meet more people who really aren't a huge tomato fan. I can't say that I absolutely like adore tomatoes. I like to eat them, but it's not like, oh, my God, I can't wait. Um, interesting fact, and I might have told this one before. <laughs> it's great when you have no memory. Everything's new to you, right? No, but it's still interesting. And I don't know where, how, how, like, you sort of like, I don't know if it's an urban legend or if there's truth. I'm sure there's somewhat of truth behind it, but it gets its nickname, the poison apple, because rich people would get sick and die after eating them because they were using pewter plates. And then, you know, tomatoes are very high in acid. So they'd put the tomatoes on the pewter plates. That would cause the leaching of the lead out of the pewter and people would eat them and get lead poisoning and die. So then therefore it was like, ah, it must be tomatoes. Why they kept serving tomatoes then? I don't know. Maybe they're slow learners like we are and have no memories and they kept doing it. And then, so yes, it got the nickname poison apple. But the Solanaceae is in the Solanaceae family, which a lot of, it's it's a very toxic family. A lot of hallucinogenic plants, Brugmansia, Datura, your eggplants, your peppers. It's a big family. Nightshade. It's called the nightshade family. A lot of poisonous plants in it. And then you randomly have edible fruits in it. So whoever figured out what is edible and what is toxic in this family, hands off to you. You're dead now. Hands off? Hats off. Joe, Joe, I'm doing hands off. I'm doing hands off. Because I don't want to touch them because they're not. Hats off, hands off, pants off. Pants off to you. Uh, 
Okay, tell me, does hats make any difference hands off? No, but you were going for a certain saying. Yeah, I was. You were. I was. Okay. Yeah. Yes. By the way, tomato story. Yeah. Three times at least. Fudge. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's new to me. might be new to some people. Jeez. I think we just need to go to doctors. Anyways, it's a fun story. If it's new to me, that's all that matters. All right. So the first one I'm going to get to, I'm going to sort of... I'm not going to necessarily get into, oh, this is how you grow tomatoes. I've had, you know, tomato people on, of course, Brad Gates from Wild Boar Tomatoes. I've had him on before and we've gone through how he grows them. Um, and so it's got a lot of good information. But I want to go into sort of the myths and sort of the outliers of – outliers? Mm -hmm. That's right. I I'm going to go term. with that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um random information. So first I'm going to start with pruning tomatoes because this is uh, this is one where I feel like people need oh yes. Have I talked about pruning tomatoes? I know I've talked about pruning. Oh, you have. I have. I know. I'm But it says a standalone uh, I'm, thing. Hold on. Okay. Pause. Meow. I'm wondering. You just told me to pause. I wonder how many people are like, wow, she's going to tolerate. He just told her, pause. Yeah. And what did you do? I meowed. <laughs> you meowed and didn't pause. So it clearly didn't work with the crap. Okay, go on. Are you projecting that you think and really want this to be a myth because you hate pruning your tomatoes and like maintaining your tomatoes? Um. No, I don't – I mean, I don't want it to be a myth. I, I can't help it that it might be a myth and that people are, might be overdoing their tomatoes and doing things they don't need to do. Don't need to do or is it detrimental? Well, I was just going to start. I was just going to talk about that, Joe. I was, that's, that's, that's where I was leading before I was told to pause. Go on. I'll question. I'll be listening. Okay. And I was going to state that years ago – it wasn't even on the radar. Never pruning tomatoes wasn't really even like talked about. Oh my god! I want to make a delineation here. Uh huh. Between pruning tomatoes uh -huh. and like controlling, training, them. controlling. Yes, I'm using them interchangeably. You are. Yes, I am. So, so when I think of like uh, you're saying controlling methodology okay. of growth, yeah. So you're talking about what's what's the uh, the, the the French vine, the French Florida weave, the Florida weave, which is the furthest from France you could get is Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. no, there's there are a lot of places in France are pretty trashy, trashy. Yeah, yeah, that's why we like France. Yeah, <laughs> good point. Um, Florida weave, you got just regular old tomato cages, right? Okay, you were – can I speak? I'm, 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 I'm trying I'm, to set the stage yes, here. Okay. Are you delineating between those types of control and maintenance versus pruning or do you see them all the same? Oh, no. Now I will delineate because you brought it up. Thank you. Because it's fitting your narrative. Yes. Okay. First of all, I'm going to talk about that there's determinate and de indeterminate tomatoes. If you happen to live around a tomato growing region in the fields, those are determinate tomatoes, which means they get to a certain size, produce X amount of fruit, and then they die. That's it. Indeterminate tomatoes is probably what, you know, 85% of the tomatoes you buy at the store are. They keep growing and growing and produce indeterminately. And if you're in a cold enough zone, which, you know, zone nine, they freeze out. So most likely they're going to freeze out. They can be perennials inside a greenhouse or very warm climate. So they just keep growing and growing. The indeterminate tomatoes are the ones you do, are we're talking about pruning because determinate you don't want to prune or train. You just sort of let it grow as a sprawling shrub. Now, as Joe mentioned, there is pruning and then there is controlling. And it is true. You could do the Florida weave that if you've listened to previous bot, uh, episodes, you know that I have, um, I failed miserably at it because that requires going out on a set schedule and not going on vacation and controlling your tomatoes. You need to describe what the Florida weave is. The Florida weave is when you have poles put every 18 inches or between every two plants and you run posts. It wasn't 18 inches. I thought they were further apart than that. Three feet. 
least. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were a plants. ways apart. Yeah. You could do it every two. So if your spacing of plants is very close, 18 inches or three feet, yeah. you have a post and then you run twine and you basically, as the plant grows, you run that twine and you weave it through. So it's acting as a cage and holding it up, but you have to do it every week because if the plants get too big and start falling over, you can't go and to me, what it looked like mm-hmm. was a, uh, a a crappy grapevine. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, the way that they like the yeah. structure, mm-hmm. just with twine mm-hmm. instead of, yeah. you know. I mean, the people who do it are masters at it. They go there and they, you know, they yeah. just do it. It's all basket weave as well. So that is one way of not really pruning your tomatoes and just controlling them. You don't even have to prune them there. Another way is, you know, the big cages you've met, I've mentioned forever. I've had the same cages for 15 plus years um, and I don't prune them. Now, if you want to trellis them, grow them on a single lead, which is one main branch, or you want to do a two leader branch system um, for whatever reason, then you get into the pruning. Now, if you're trying to grow in small space and you want multiple varieties, or you just don't even have the space for a big crowded tomato, then that is one reason to prune your tomatoes. Now, people start getting really into like, where you have to prune the suckers off. Now, suckers are a little strange because when you think of suckers, I usually think of a rootstock on citrus or fruit trees, and that sucker is the rootstock and it's taking over the vigor of the scion, the grafted part. When you're talking about a tomato sucker, what you're talking about is you see the stem, you see a leaf, and then between that axle of the stem and the leaf, a new branch, a new stem starts growing. That is considered a sucker on a tomato plant. And the theory is, is you have to remove those because those are going to take energy away from producing fruits and flowers from the main stem. Well, that's actually not true, what it will do is make your plant very bushy, very out of control. And if you're okay with that, then that's fine. If you have a big cage like I do, it's pretty much fine. But if you're trying to go for a very neat, orderly, thinned out look for whatever reason, then you do have to remove the suckers. Now, the suckers will grow, they will flower, and they will fruit. So it's not like they're taking energy away without producing fruits and flowers. And this is more of an aesthetic. Some people like that really tidy look where you see all the exposed fruits. That's fine. Theory is you prune your fruit, you prune the tomatoes, less foliage, you get more sunlight, you get bigger fruits, they ripen faster. That might be true, but the other downside is too much sun, your tomatoes could sunburn. And so the biggest theory is, is it true? And no one has shown me studies yet that if you prune a tomato of its foliage and keep one stem or two main leaders, that you will get true bigger individual fruits versus if you don't prune, you'll get more fruit, but smaller fruits. And so the theory is, is you don't like a fruit tree. You have to thin your fruits so more energy goes into individual fruits. But you got to keep in mind that there's only so X amount. It's true on a fruit tree. There's so many fruits and they cluster together. But I've never really seen a big difference. I've never seen a big difference between celebrity fruits on a tomato being tiny when you haven't pruned it versus not pruning it. And cherry tomatoes, I mean, come on, they're going to be small anyway. So I think genetics outride that on tomato plants. That's where you come in and you say something. No, I don't have an argument with about yeah. that part. Mm-hmm. I, I can't find any studies or data besides the general rule, less fruit, more energy goes into individual fruits and you get bigger fruits. Less foliage, you have more sun coming in, you're going to have faster ripening. That might be correct. But then, like I said, you might have more sunburn more foliage, you're going to have more energy go into the foliage than you are into the individual fruits. It's really an aesthetic. And if you want to prune it in a space thing, but what I have figured and I've talked to other people is there's absolutely no need, need or scientific proof that you need to prune your tomato plants. That's it. Hands down. 
So when you were saying pruning, mm -hmm. are you talking about removing just the blossom or nodule where it will come from? You didn't listen or, to anything I said. No, I did. I said the sucker, which is the growth, the stems that are coming out of the axle of the main stem. So basically it's branching off. Hold on. Uh, it's branching okay. off. Okay. That doesn't answer my question. I don't understand what you said there. <laughs> So, like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. Answer it, because I have no idea what you're talking about. So you have a stem on I, a tomato. I got that. Just listen to my question again. Oh, wow. Someone's you, coming in spicy tonight. Are you removing just the part of the plant, right, the most distal part where the fruit is going to emerge from? Or are you removing other... The aspect of it that includes, like you said, you're you're cutting an axial portion. So in my mind, I'm seeing like other leaves and such on that portion. Correct. That is what we're removing. Okay. So now my question is, mm -hmm. why would you not preferentially just remove the buds or if there's like a pre-bud, wherever the fruit's going to emerge from, mm -hmm. why not remove just that? Because uh, you're removing, like you said, this axial growth mm -hmm. that has leaves and such on it. Aren't you effectively, if this was a solar panel, wouldn't you be removing portions of the solar panel that could be collecting sunlight and producing more energy? Oh, I see where you're going. Yeah. You think more green, more photosynthetic more green, more material. More photosynthetic material. I, I mean, I hear you. There is an argument for that too. So then why not? Can you just remove the, like I said, the most distal part uh -huh. that is going to produce the fruit? Yeah. So you let that foliage grow. And then as soon as it starts forming flower buds, you remove that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. A hundred percent. Okay. There's no studies though, but I think it's because people – uh, you could also say though that more foliage leads to more shading of all the, the photosynthetic part. My point of all this is there is no data telling me one way or the other because it goes back and forth. It goes back to all the rules at? of um, various things throughout months and years. Well, I'm talking research. Uh, like University I'm, of North Carolina, University of New Hampshire. For just tomato plants or for other plants as well? Tomato plants right now. Okay. Their, their main thing and what everyone 100% agrees on is removing the lower leaves will prevent splashing of the soil and possibly reduce pathogen transmission. Okay. And that is everyone agrees with that. All right. Everything else then they sort of – there's no – it's their cooperative extensions – so it's sort of a fluff piece. It's not data driven. Um, well, that's an issue. It, it is an issue. It's an issue everywhere. But I guess the thing is, is people want to prune their tomatoes, let them prune their tomatoes. What yeah. becomes a problem is when people are like, I have to prune my tomatoes. I'm going to get more fruit. I'm going to get bigger yield. And it goes back to just even what you said. Well, a plant with more green, right. in theory, is going to have more energy reserves to produce more. So... Um, I guess the takeaway from this is you don't have to prune your tomatoes. You do have to control your tomatoes some way, either a big cage or pruning them or training them. That's the takeaway. Yep. And that Joe likes to tell me to be quiet. And what was the, what was the other word you just said? Shh. Calm oh, down. No. <laughs> calm down. We, we, do not, we do not say that at all. Okay. So that's pruning tomatoes. Now let's get on to the Epsom salt thing. And if, you know, this is just, I could what, die on a hill of Epsom salts. I'll die on. What this is, is not the hill you want to die on. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. I don't want to die on Epsom salt hill. I bet there's a proxy that you could look going back to the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, We're not going back. We are just talking about tomatoes. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Fruit, like looking at oranges and stuff. Yeah. You know, there mm -hmm. may be some research out there in terms of helping, uh, Enhance propagation of – enhance optimization of growth size. It's the same thing. It's olives. It's fruit. It's anything. You want air circulation. You want sunlight to come through. I know. I'm thinking the same thing in terms of – But you also want the most yield. Yeah. So you don't prune everything back because you want as much, you know – yeah. So I don't know why all of a sudden tomatoes, it's like you have to prune. Uh, yeah. So are they thinking about yield or – Quality of fruit. I think they're thinking quality, size of fruit. Okay. Which I'm saying is genetics don't vary that much with no. tomatoes. Generally, when you have a problem with fruit, stone fruits forming very small is because they're like literally hitting each other and bumping and there's not enough space for them to grow. On tomatoes, 
they form in, you know, big clusters. So they're, they're genetically uh, predispositioned to grow in clusters. You're not going to have that much result in size. Right. Right. All right. So Epsom salts. If you've heard me talk about Epsom salts, you know, you've seen it everywhere. It's like put Epsom salts in your tomatoes to create sweeter tomatoes. One, I like sour tomatoes. Two, I don't even notice the difference in taste that much. But Epsom salts, it's magnesium sulfate. At work, you've heard me mention that we take 50-pound bags. Well, we actually take the 50-pound bags and we use 25 pounds of it at a time. But we start with pure, pure DI water. So we have to put magnesium back in and that's how we do it. Stop. Fingers up. I just want to interject. Mm -hmm. When you say 50-pound bags, mm -hmm. my only reference – yeah. Is cat litter because we buy cat litter by the 50 pound bags. Yes, we do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So yeah, 50 pound bags. It's like cat litter. Anyway, so Epsom salts, it's a fertilizer. It's a salt. You add more salt, you add more fertilizer when it's not needed. What do you do? You could potentially burn your plants. When you add extra fertilizer and you don't need it, it throws other fertilizer or other nutrients out of whack. Um, so you're not just adding it with going, oh, more is better. You're potentially hurting the equilibrium of the nutrients in the soil. Does not make anything sweeter. If you have a magnesium deficiency, which is very rare to have magnesium deficiency in the soil, then you can add Epsom salts. Uh, usually if you have magnesium deficiency, the leaves will be yellowing from the outside in and you will have curling, but magnesium deficiency mimics a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot, mimics potentially nitrogen deficiency, iron deficiency, manganese deficiency. So definitely make sure you have magnesium deficiency before you add Epsom salts, else you were just adding more salt, which could burn, and you may throw other nutrients out of whack. So no, and then I will always still get the person, oh, I add it and my tomatoes are great. Well, maybe you're not adding huge amounts or down the road, it's going to be a problem. Um, but yeah, you don't want to just willy nilly spray that stuff on your tomatoes. All right. Blossom end rot sprays. You've heard me talk about this before. Blossom end rot is when the blossom end of the tomato has a big brown blotchy, uh, mushy area, usually early in the season. And you may see the blossom sprays at the store. I've seen people say, put Tums, make a tum spray, sprinkle Tums, add eggshells. Yes, those all have calcium. Eggshells have calcium. Tums have calcium. If it truly is a calcium deficiency that you are lacking, eggshells and Tums are not going to do the trick. Eggshells take forever to break down. Tums, I think you would need to add like a whole truckload or so to get the calcium in there. Once again, very rare to have calcium deficiency in your soil. It's almost always a water issue, meaning you're not, the water is not moving that calcium up from the soil through the roots to the ends of the fruit where it's getting at. And usually it's an early season where temperatures of the soil and outside air are fluctuating and the moisture is fluctuating and it's just not taking it up. You can't spray calcium on fruit and have it absorb through the fruit. You can't spray calcium on the leaves and have it get it through the roots or through the uh, tomatoes. It literally has to come from the soil, go through the roots. It moves one way. So do not buy the balsam end sprays. If you think they're working, it's just because usually your second set of tomatoes by then temperatures have evened out and you don't have the same issue. So always mulch your plants because that's going to keep the soil moisture even and uh, prevent those sporadic uptake of the calcium. All right. Can we talk about marigolds for a bit, Joe? Um, yeah, not exactly what I was expecting. Oh, you weren't expecting talking about marigolds? No, you said tomatoes. We're talking about marigolds and tomatoes. Oh, well, that's an addition. Yes. So, you know, we've talked about companion planting before and how that one is a big old myth. Big myth. Big. It's a myth as in very these specific things. There's nothing a myth about companion planting. It just makes it basically plant a variety of flowers and fruits and just to get pollinators in, have pollinator hosts, um, everything because different pollinators like different flowers. Now, the funny thing with tomatoes is, is you know, their pollinators are wind or the bees. And bees don't really go to marigolds. They're not high in like the pollen that bees want. But people plant them, literally think you have to plant a, toma a marigold in between each tomato plant to ward off pests. And the first thing I always say to people is, you're warding off aphids, aren't you? And they're like, yes. 
I said, have you ever, ever seen an aphid on a tomato? Never. Never. They have their own natural uh, resistance to aphids. They will get other pests. But then you will see the aphids at the marigolds and you go, well, if you didn't even plant marigolds, would you even have aphids in the vicinity? They're just going to the marigolds. So that is a big like myth that people have to plant marigolds to deter aphids and other pests. And, you know, I've done a whole thing on companion planting, so I won't start, you know, just going into that again. There's definitely episodes you could check out about that. Um, I do want to talk about rotating crops. Like why you can't grow tomatoes in the same field or same area too many years in a row. And I thought everyone knew, but the other day someone mentioned to me, they're like, oh, it's because tomatoes use different nutrients that they're pulling out of the soil. I'm like, break. And then I had to give them a lesson. Well, no, tomatoes require the same amount of nutrients that other plants do. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all the macro and micronutrients. Uh, It's the... It's the pa- it's the fungal pathogens in there. Joe, what are the two major fungal pathogens that I'm talking about? Since I'm losing you because you can't tell me to pause. Powdery mildew. No. It's a foliar fungus that they usually don't get. All right. Pathogen. Mm-hmm. In the soil. Um, what's uh, nematodes? No, that's a, a, a pest, but good. Good for you. Good for you. Hmm. Pathogen mm-hmm. in soil. Mm-hmm. Something bacillus. No, that's a good bacteria. I know that. Okay. That one bacillus. What about fusarium wilt? Okay. And verticillium wilt? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wasn't going to happen. Okay. Wasn't going to happen. Great. Okay. So those are two soil borne pathogens that uh, fusarium will just outright kill your tomato. It'll grow. And then all of a sudden, it'll just brown and wilt. Verticillium wilt, your plant could grow and struggle turn yellow and suck, parts of it will brown and it might as well be dead because it just looks awful. But both of them are soil-borne fungal pathogens that stay in the soil for years and years. So if you have it in your soil, the idea is and why people rotate crops is you can't keep giving it the host to live on. So if you think you have it in your soil, you know, you've had it on the plants, you need to start planting in a different area. And it's not just one year. It could last up to 10 years in the soil. I'm not saying you can never plant there again, but what you want to do is make sure that it starts dying off. So weeds could even be a host. So if you'd say, oh, I'm not going to plant in this area, but you let certain weeds grow, they could still be the host for it. Because uh, as soon as the roots of plants that they like make contact with it, then it's, oh, ha- we're happy. So that's why you'll see like people planting corn or oats or something in an area where tomatoes were at because... Um, they do it preemptively, but if you definitely know, think you have fusarium or verticillium wilt, another option, of course, is planting verticillium or fusarium wilt resistant uh, hybrid plants. And on the tags, they'll say they have an F or a V for resistance there, or just move that area out and just let it sit for years and not plant in it. And of course, that goes for your eggplants and your peppers too, because they're still in the Solanaceae family, so they could still be susceptible to it. Any downside of the resistant ones, like in terms of uh, overall yield, et cetera? No, I mean, but you are definitely, you know, you're limited with, you know, if you really want, oh, I love this heirloom, you're going to be sort of limited to more of just a red standard or maybe a cherry tomato standard. None of the fancy ones because they're, you know, hybrid bred for resistance. So you're going to be limited to the variety that you that you grow. So bread or modified? I assume modified than bread. No, they're just I think they're I I think they're just selected out. I'm talking day one. It could be just a, a, a mutation. Could be. Could be. Could be. I don't know. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll could, look it up. You could look it up. Yeah. Yeah. Could be GMO. I'm going modified Could bread. Could be GMO, Joe. <laughs> uh, which, you know, I'll just say that I'm not totally opposed to because um, it's helped a lot in certain areas of the world. Yeah, if you want your food and yield. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's not affecting me. I know enough about DNA and genetics. I know if I eat this tomato, it's not going to, you know, I'm not going to become a tomato. 
No, the GMO is not going to affect you with as much Snickers as you eat. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm turning red and round for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with me eating tomatoes. It probably has me uh, just getting out of shape and eating ice cream more than <laughs> turning red and round from tomatoes. Uh, all right. Um, we're going to talk about... Uh, can See, you... Now that may be what offends people. Me turning red and round? No, from my commentary. Oh, would you say? I, I said it won't be the GMO that gets It'll you. It'll be the Snickers? It'll be the Snickers, yeah. Oh, see, that doesn't offend me. I know, I know, because you don't I... even eat Snickers. Well, how do you know I don't hide them and eat them and not in front of you? <laughs> because you would not be able to hide them because you'd eat them all so fast. Yeah, good point. No, I mean, yeah, I love Snickers. <laughs> I eat a lot. Can't, I can't help that. Uh, okay, I just want to talk about burying a tomato stem a bit because there's some, you know, information like why is it the only plant you could bury the stem on? Every time I'm always telling people is plant higher, plant your woody plant slightly higher because the soil is going to settle. You don't want it to be underground. You always want to plant things at the same soil level as the root ball. But then all of a sudden tomatoes come along and you're like, bury that mother. Effer. Yes. <laughs> Modified brute. What about it? That's what you're bearing. Well, oh, oh, uh, oh, you're giving the answer already. Yeah. Oh, I was going off on my tirade of like, no. why? Okay. Yeah. Yes, Joe. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So, you know, roots form at the nodes, but if you see a lot of tropical plants, like house plants, all of, you know, all along the stems, you'll have these little roots form. You even see this like on, um, you know, certain plants that sucker like ivy. Oh, wow. Now your finger's up and waving. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Is it similar in any aspect to an aeroid? Yes, it is, Joe. Very good. <laughs> Very good. That's what I was talking about with tropical plants is they will more. form these aerial roots. Now, tropical plants do it because when, you know, a lot of them could be epiphytic, meaning they can start in the soil, but the majority of their foliage is up out in the air. But they're in humid areas, so they rely on their adventitious aerial roots forming to get air moisture from the air. And then when it rains, tomatoes aren't necessarily like that, but they can do that, even though they're more Mediterranean based. If you do bury the stem, it won't, won't rot necessarily, but all those dormant buds will form adventitious roots and you'll get a bigger root system faster. And so, you know, of course, we're past planting tomatoes. I would say mid-June is the latest you could plant them. I've done that before and got perfectly fine fruit. But I'm just mentioning that. It's like, why? Why do it? And then I've heard some things like, oh, you want to trench it by burying it and turning the stem on the side. And I think it might have been even Farmer Fred who's like, well, you don't want to bury the stem straight down because the further in the ground that you grow or dig, this might have been Brad Gates, one of those tomato guys, um, it's cooler and you're planting, say, in April and May. So the further down you dig, the cooler the soil. And of course, that's going to inhibit growth. But sometimes it's a little, you know, iffy trying to, you know. So I usually bury the tomato stem, you know, like three inches or up to the first set of leaves and remove those leaves. So that's just one tip that I do do because it does help. In fact, at work, we grow tomatoes in hydroponics units and I start them in seeds in pots and I pluck them out of the soil. And instead of just planting the root part, it'll be really floppy. I will stick the roots and a good portion of the stem under into the hydroponics area and all those roots form. So I use that as an advantage to get small plants started faster. Joe, do you know what uh, zippering, cracking and cat facing are? On tomatoes? Yes. Because we, we have experienced cat facing. We know what cat facing yeah, is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, isn't that where uh, you get the tomato cracking? Now, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's because of lack of moisture and it begins to, it's either lack of moisture or too much moisture. Too much moisture. Too much. Okay. Too much at one time. Yep. Where the outside hasn't developed. And all of a sudden it gets a big surge of water coming in. Yep. And that could be, it could be, you know, variety dependent how thick and thin a skin is. It could be if you've stressed your plant and all of a sudden it's dying of thirst and you give it water and it takes it up and then cracking. 
Um, usually you see it, you know, at the top part of it. So just keep that soil moisture uh, and temperature cool by mulching and not going through those fluctuations of, you know, too dry, too wet, too dry, too wet. All right. What's zippering? Well, I thought they were all the same. No. I was using that oh. in one, one no, answer. No, for zippering is different. No, I don't know then. Okay. Zippering is when you have this, it almost looks like a scar that's been like a, a stitch. It's this brown, follows the curvature of the tomato. Very even. It's not an open wound. It looks like a scar, but almost like someone's been stitched up. Uh, that's called zippering. And that is what happens when the female part, the style gets stuck on to the developing ovary, the fruit. And as the plant's growing, it literally is scarring it. So it's not moving, but it's just swelling up. So it's causing that same pattern. And it's totally fine. Uh, but it's very distinct looking. And you could be wondering what that is. All right, cat facing. Don't know. It's when your cat looks at you with that disgust because he's judging you. No, sorry. That's just our cats. That's all cats. Cat facing is when you have just the most bizarre, it's like, bumps and lumps and it, yeah, I don't know how, it, you know, it's insulting to cats by calling it cat facing because it's downright ugly looking. And I'm really offended for cats if whoever came up with this thinks that's what cats look like. I see it a lot in heirloom tomatoes, but, and there's a sort of, you know, there's no definite like, oh, this is definitely what causes it. Um, I, like I said, I find it more on heirlooms. I think we were talking about uh, talking to, I think it was Farmer Fred, and he was saying how the earliest fruit f ones are get it. Or no, I think it was Brad Gates. Um, cool season, when it's still slightly cool and the fruits are forming, they could be the ones that get it the most. But I've had heirlooms have it almost all through the whole entire season. Perfectly fine to eat. Uh, just really funky looking. Um, so it's still like no definite answer on what, what causes the cat facing, but cracking is the one that you could sort of control by keeping the soil moisture even. And the others are just, you know, they're not horrible. You could still eat it. In fact, you may find a few bugs in the cat facing, but they're really not into the fruit. They're just into the cracks. All right, Joe, do you have anything else to throw out for, uh, tomatoes? I don't believe I do. I don't. Uh, my tomato knowledge is very minimal. We know you're like I don't like them, and that is you, and you have this thing where I don't like tomatoes. I I think it might be the fact that a few times you've told me, Marlene, I don't like tomatoes. No, they're not I'm my just, favorite thing. Okay, they're not your favorite thing. If I'm having a salad, mm -hmm. the only time that there'll be tomatoes in it for the most part is if I'm like at a lunch and I ask them to put nothing on the salad. Mm -hmm. And when I mean nothing, I mean nothing. You just want lettuce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they still put tomatoes on it. Because they're like, who the heck is this guy who just wants lettuce? They're like, you want croutons? No. No. Do you want do you want cucumbers? No. Do you want dressing? No. You're like, literally just give me lettuce. Yep. And they're like, we can't send this out. This is just lettuce. Yeah, so they put tomatoes They're on They're like, this guy must like something. Let's, you know what? Tomatoes. Most people like tomatoes. Let's do tomatoes. And then- so I eat the tomatoes for the most part. Why? Are you embarrassed to take them off because you'll look even more bizarre? No, because if I get like a burger, I definitely take those tomatoes we off. We know. Yeah. In fact, I've seen you take everything off of a hamburger and just eat the meat. Yeah. I'm like, why are you ordering the bacon avocado cheeseburger? No, no, no I eat that stuff. <laughs> I eat the avocado. I eat but the bacon. But separate. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Wait a minute. Hold on. We got to go back to tomatoes. So, no, I'm saying I don't not like tomatoes. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're not your favorite thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just talk about tomato pollination real quick. Okay. Uh, so some people may be like, well, I'm not getting fruit set. And I think people have heard me before that if you have heirloom varieties, some of the, they don't set fruit as much. If you have a huge producing one, like one, you know, it's a giant beef steak, a mortgage lifter, they don't produce as many. It goes back to more energy goes into the fruit. So that is a Hold genetic a thing. Hold Whoa. On. Yeah. Hold on. A big beef steak. Uh-huh. And its name was a beefsteak mortgage lifter? No, there's beefsteak and there's another tomato called mortgage lifter. Mortgage lifter? Yeah. Mortgage lifter. Yeah, mortgage what, lifter. What is the genesis I think you might be able to sell that tomato and uh, raise money for your mortgage. It's when mortgages were really, really huh. cheap. Huh. Like, like your parents' huh. era. Not now. Yeah, mortgage lifter. It's big. It's meaty. Uh. So that could be why some are not. 
you know, and then you also may have a lot of flowers forming, but the plant's still young. When temperatures, they say, in theory, when temperatures get 90 degrees, flat, fruit won't set won't happen. Well, that's not true because we live in the Central Valley. It's almost always above 90 and fruit sets. So uh, if you are having pollination issues, remember pollination, they're perfect flowers. I mean, there's female and male parts on the same flower. They're perfectly capable of pollinating each other, meaning the the male part pollen will fall onto the female part and it'll pollinate itself. But it does have to be buzzed so any old pollinator doesn't just come along and steal the pollen. And the buzzing at a certain frequency, it's actually pretty variable. Wind could do it. And then, of course, bees, they'll come and they'll buzz at a certain frequency. And that's where you hear the, oh, take a old toothbrush and do it. Or they even have those pollinating wands. And that's true. That works. But just shaking it is fine. But that's the reason behind it. And the reason behind a lot of times, you know, begonias, well, the same thing is they have to be buzzed at a certain frequency because you just don't want to drop your pollen for any old pollinator that comes along. You want to make sure you're going to be in a relationship with this pollinator and make sure it moves, which is funny because like begonias are male and female flowers. So they have to actually get it to the female flowers. I don't know why the tomato pollen can't just drop on itself. It has to be buzzed, but I guess that ensures, um, I'm not really quite sure what that ensures. You think it could almost be a time thing where it just dumps the pollen, but, uh, I guess it ensures that it's released at the right amount at the right time. I don't know. I'll have to do some more research why the evolutionary that is the case, right? You want me to remind you of that? follow up no nah, i'm trying make, to i'm gonna try, i'm here. gonna try to think that one through i mean no, i mean why th- so think it through right now it works why if a flower is going to pollinate itself but it needs yeah okay hear me out the reason being is ideally it's not going to pollinate itself it probably will do some cross pollination so it's capable of pollinating itself but by having bees do it it's probably going to ensure that it's cross-pollinated and then you might get some of your genetics variability dispersed. It's the only thing I could think of. So, yeah. Good. I thought it out. It's always It always comes up to genetic just variables. Don't pollinate yourself. That's Don't marry your cousin. Don't pollinate yourself. There. Unless you married your cousin, it's fine. No judging here. Thinking there may be other, uh, you know, Scenarios you perhaps may not have thought of with that. Marrying your brother? <laughs> That's, Joe, I'm just not even going to think about that one. Okay, what are they? No, I don't have any. I'm just okay, saying. I'm thinking, you're, yeah. you're in of one, and you're just going, well, that is it. I definitely found it. Yeah, I have solved it. Yep, I have solved it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so I think I'm going to wrap up tomato talk. Tomato myths and other info. Um, so yeah, if you're curious about tomato growing episodes, definitely for the ones with Brad Gates and a few others and, and down the road, we will talk about, uh, possibly some tomato, more tomato diseases and what's going on with your tomatoes. But if you liked this podcast, please rate and review it. Give it a five star on Spotify and give it a review on iTunes, five star as well. Tell your friends, share it with your friends. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Marlene the Plant Lady. And if you have a question, email me at Marlene the Plant Lady at gmail.com. And until next time, everyone, happy gardening.